Pokemon Red and Blue, as works, fixate a lot on the material realities of Kanto as a society. Team Rocket, as opposed to later games' evil teams, is made up of disenfranchised members of society who are looking for some amount of financial or societal recourse. Gamblers wander the streets, drunk off their winnings. One of the many things the player encounters as they progress through the game is a burglarized home, and the man behind the curtain at Team Rocket is part of the institutions of power that claim to be doing their best to stymie him in his efforts. The only place of an abstract or spiritual nature is Lavender Town, a place built around its reverence for the deceased Pokemon of the Kanto region and haunted by their spirits. This brief moment of the ethereal is an interesting break from the down-to-earth realities of the rest of the region, and yet, Lavender Town's brush with the ghostly is not present in Pokemon Gold and Silver, Pokemon Red and Blue's sequels. Pokemon Gold and Silver present an interesting counterpoint to Kanto's near-cynical reckonings with reality. Where its predecessor was one mired in the material here and now, Pokemon Gold and Silver presents the Johto region as a deeply spiritual one, with locations often fixate on the region's rich culture as opposed to the more consumerist locations of Kanto. One of the first towns the player will encounter along their journey is one with a tower dedicated to the spiritual worship and reverence of the seemingly innocuous Pokemon Bellsprout, a monument to the natural world. Ecrotique City has two religious towers, one burned and one still standing, which were sacred places to pray to two godlike Pokemon, legends abounding about the mysterious fire among those who still wander the ruins of the former. The Dragon's Den in Blackthorn City is a shrine entirely constructed around the Pokemon Dratini, an Omega to the Bellsprout's Alpha, a bookend to a bookend. There are deep religious intonations throughout Johto's contrast to Kanto, but this dichotomy alone isn't what this work seeks to underline, rather it is Kanto's apparent emptiness once the player has finished the trials of Johto, the barren material world that awaits them after their deeply spiritual journey. The journey through a hollow Kanto serves as the epilogue of Pokemon Gold and Silver, its existence proof of the requisite nature of the spiritual through how lifeless it feels in terms of its functionality as a simple shuffling from encounter to encounter, the fragmented ghostly existence of Team Rocket as an entity within both Kanto and Johto, the destruction of Lavender Town's Pokemon graveyard and the structure that replaced it, and ultimately the protagonist of Red and Blue is a void shell atop the world's called its peak, only extant to be conquered by the player, and no self or character to speak of. Pokemon Gold and Silver, like every other Pokemon game, contains a narrative progression gated by eight boss fights all across the game's world as a contextualization of the adventure. Progression between these boss fights is often done through the progression of specific plot events, most notably that one cannot wrap up the last gym match until after dealing with Team Rocket's capture of the radio tower. Characters encounter and entangle themselves with the player along the way, be they the helpful Professor L who bequeaths their first Pokemon to the player, or the player's aloof rival who ends up going through a Bildung's Roman apotheosis of his own by the end of the main text, which similarly allows him to connect with his Pokemon companions on a spiritual level as opposed to a strictly ruthlessly pragmatic and unfeeling one. The region's champion even comes to the player's aid more than once, beginning somewhat of a monomythic archetype throughout the Pokemon games. Once the player has completed the Johto region, however, something specific only to Gold and Silver and its future rewrites occurs. The player the player takes on the gym challenge in Kanto as they did one game prior and fights eight more gyms. This journey through Kanto differs substantially from the journey through Johto, though. There are no more character interactions that punctuate the proceedings or much of a narrative arc to speak of. Those were left in the land of spirituality, Johto's ode to humanism, Kanto is a land of pure function. There is no mystery to the proceedings here, only a funnel through which the player goes from badge to badge, some wonder in how the order shifted from the order taken in their last adventure in Kanto, but ultimately a retread without any new accentuations. Kanto is nothing more than a theme park iteration of itself, showcasing all of its locations without meaning or their historical context, a representation of something grander. Team Rocket appear throughout Pokemon Gold and Silver, even in the Johto region, and initially seen to be doing well for themselves in spite of Giovanni's disappearance at the end of Pokemon Red and Blue due to the player's intervention in his plans and the events of those games. They are first encountered early on in the Zalia town running a grift involving the poaching and sale of the tales of the extremely vulnerable Pokemon Slowpoke, and the player has to put a stop to their affairs there. It becomes clear over the course of the encounters that the player has with Team Rocket during the game that not all is well with them and their leadership, a deep ennui echoed throughout their ranks at the loss of their leader, 
As part of the game's climax, Team Rocket captures the region's radio tower and tries to use it to contact Giovanni, to no response. This call to the void for a god, for absolution of any and all kind, is met with nothing in response. The wasteland encroached upon all of Team Rocket. None of their current leadership is up to the task, and none of them given even a name in this original text as they are only defined by an ideology that has left them and the world behind, and their appeals to their ghosts have failed. So Team Rocket largely disappears after this affair. The material crime scene Syndicate of Kanto not able to survive without a faith in a land full of it, but there is one more encore performance from them before the second credits roll in the Kanto region. One last vestige of Team Rocket holds on in Kanto's Cerulean City, and his story ends with a whimper as he leaves to go start a family. He declares the final death of Team Rocket there, the gallery of ghosts closed as its final exhibition exits the picture. This fragmentation and loss of faith is another soliloquy to the need for the spiritual and the material, for without a guiding light or faith or individuality to maintain their ideology and ambition, Team Rocket becomes a walking corpse, and eventually falls into shambles entirely. While Kanto itself is an exhumed corpse in these texts, Pokemon Gold and Silver's interpretation of it contains no respite for those damned to oblivion. The Pokemon Tower, once the only bastion of the spiritual in a highly material and objective world, has been completely demolished here, replaced with a commercial radio tower. The end result is a town that has lost its identity, Lavender Town defined by a consumerist monolith is opposed to the macabre and chilling air that the original location used to stand out amongst its peers as a break from the game's total hegemonic aesthetic identity. Even the music that plays throughout Lavender Town has been sanitized to some extent. The bleak chiptune that permeated its spaces in red and blue now a much more chipper, major, keyed iteration of that same track. The forces of capital have eroded all the mysticism and wonder from the land, the last part of Kanto that had yet to be totally industrialized and carved out from its insides, and a grim reminder of what is to happen to Johto in the coming decades. Though it's a brief stop on the journey to attaining all of Kanto's badges, Lavender Town is easily the most memorable due to this abrupt shift. An irony considering that, should the player have no understanding of what came before, it would be as unremarkable as all the rest of Kanto's hegemony. The ultimate culmination of this work's intertextual meta-commentary, however, comes atop Mount Silver, the work's final super dungeon that is only fully scalable after the League challenge has been completed a second time. It is atop this peak of peaks, the highest point in all the two regions that have made up the entirety of the known world thus far, that the player encounters themselves from red and blue, an empty haunting at the summit of their strength. This endless climb for material power has led this player character, named Red in the text of Gold and Silver, to become an empty husk, and thus the reward is to stare into the abyss for all eternity, only as a challenge to the next player who seeks the same fate. The player, now wizened from their journeys in Johto, is able to defeat this dark mirror of themselves, who in exchange is only able to utter nothingness in response, an apathy at all of creation that doesn't concern their ever-expanding line of worldly accomplishments. They climbed the mountain to conquer conquer nature for man's constructions had not been enough and found nothing to satisfy them. And in the end, they were still defeated by someone else who followed in their footsteps anyway. What a cold existence to have lived, one that the player may fall victim to again and again, material accomplishments prioritized over self-realization, identity only defined by meaningless titles and deeds. Entropy will claim red and all their accomplishments will be washed over, and it will not have been worth it for they made no helpful impact on the world in the first place aside from outing a crime boss whose syndicate was small time compared to the systems of abuse that created it anyway. The player synthesizes their knowledge of the material and the spiritual, however, and triumphs over Red. Red stays, but the player leaves. And so the curtain falls on the two players in the two-act feature. One who follows for the endless violence of JRPG progression, and one who is overcome. The discourse that Pokemon Gold and Silver engages in is in many ways microcosmic of the series' ideology on the whole. There is a sort of didactic value put upon friendship and connection over strict and calculated mechanical pragmatism, which usually manifests pretty textually and bluntly as seen with the player's rival in this game. However, where Gold and Silver succeeds, if unintentionally, is that that pragmatism is truly embodied through the realities of the Kanto postgame. The Dead World being a purely functional series of challenges punctuated by the fractured state of Team Rocket, the absurd replacement of the Pokemon Tower with a radio station, and finally the confrontation with the shadow atop Mount Silver that ends the work entirely. All these come together to form the postmodern empty landscapes of Kanto, and serve as an argument for why the world needs more than material truths. This has been Arcade Everlasting, who's kicking herself for being a Gen 2 hater in the past, signing off. Thank you for watching.